Okay, you guys, I think we're going to get started now. It's my pleasure to introduce... Yeah, thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tim Mitchell, who um, most of you know very well. Um, so Tim is a Northwest native. He was born in Colville, Washington, and grew up here and did his undergraduate work in Montana, and then took a really interesting detour I was just learning about today. He, um, after undergraduate, he moved to Baltimore and he was working for the National Institute of Drug Abuse and was doing research there, so this really ties into um, his presentation today. He was looking at uh, basically neuronal effects of repeated exposure to certain substances, including cocaine, I believe, and rats. Um, from there, um, went to medical school in New York and then saw the wisdom of coming back to the Northwest. So he's been um, with us here at the University of Washington for his residency and now his fellowship. So um, his research um, has been with Dr. Adams Waldorf and um, he's done some very elegant work looking at um, the effects of um, fetal exposure to inflammation and infection, particularly in cardiac remodeling and genomic um, underpinnings of that. We're going to go back to his days at um, NIDA and talk about an entirely different topic. I think this illustrates his versatility um, and we're all really looking forward to your talk. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Hitty. Um, so again, uh, thanks everybody for being here. I'm hoping that everybody is able to walk away from this talk with a little bit more understanding of marijuana use in pregnancy and, and how we can counsel our patients um, regarding uh, their use in pregnancy. Um, so to kind of go over what I want to talk about today, um, I want to talk a little bit about the history of marijuana, its targets, how it's consumed, um, the legalization here in the United States over the past um, 20 years, um, and then go into the pharmacodynamics in pregnancy, pregnancy outcomes, um, and then detour a little bit into the basic science of the endogenous cannabinoid system's role in fetal development, and then look at neurodevelopmental outcomes and uh, medical society's views and, and how we can actually counsel our patients. Um, I think that you know many of us have had patients since uh, marijuana has been legalized here in the state of Washington who consume marijuana in pregnancy and, and since legalization it's become a little bit more difficult to counsel them because prior to 2014 we could you know, always discuss the, the risks of, of having an illegal substance in your, in your system but um, CPS or, and, and our social workers really don't really refer for positive THC screens anymore given the prevalence of its use. Um, there has to be a lot of other high risk issues before it, it triggers any sort of um, uh, state intervention. So um, hopefully we can discuss other means other than legal actions with our patients. So cannabis belongs to the plant family Cannabaceae. It's, there are three main um, species uh, that differ in biochemical components. You have cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and then a more uncommon form of cannabis ruderalis. The first two um, strains are strains that we commonly see patients using. Um, there are over 500 compounds in these, in these uh, plants, 85 different cannabinoids, and the ratios um, of the different cannabinoids depend on how the, depend on the strain and depend on how they're bred. Um, the other constituents are very similar to tobacco, other than the fact that there is no nicotine. Uh, cannabis sativa is commonly known as marijuana. It's what um, has more psychoactive effects. Cannabis indica is uh, known as industrial hemp. However, it is consumed for uh, medicinal purposes. There are two um, main cannabinoids that have been studied, delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol, also known as THC, as well as cannabidiol, which is uh, commonly known as CBD. Um, THC is primarily found in marijuana and it has, it's the psychoactive cannabinoid. Um, it has many CNS targets. Its main targets are the cannabinoid receptor 1 and cannabinoid, cannabinoid receptor 2. Um, and it can have many different actions within the central nervous system. It can act as an agonist, an antagonist, an enhancer, an activator. Um, its psychoaffective effects can produce euphoria, analgesia, um, cognitive modulation, as well as reduce nausea and be used as an appetite stimulant. CBD is um, commonly found in uh, industrial hemp, but it is uh, often used for medicinal purposes. 
it does not come along with the psycho effect or psycho uh, active effect that you see with THC. Um, however, there are many studies that have looked at its um, efficacy in helping reduce seizure load in patients with epilepsy, and it's um, a, it comes in oils that patients will co commonly consume. And I've had a couple of patients who use CBD oil throughout the pregnancy to um, try to reduce their seizure threshold. Um, the endogenous cannabinoid signaling system um, is the receptors are found primarily in the uh, central nervous system. Um, CBR1, uh, which are targeted by THC, are primarily found in areas that are important for movement, like the basal ganglia, cognition, and attention, the cerebral cortex, as well as emotion and memory, the amygdala, and hippocampus. Um, they're also found in the periphery, like the GI tract, the liver, reproductive organs. CB2 um, uh, receptors found in immune cells, like B cells, natural killer cells, but they're also found um, within the brain stem. Endogenous cannabinoids are tightly regulated, and unlike other neurotransmitters, um, they're not stored, they're produced on demand. So they can work in very specific spatial temporal patterns depending on exactly where and when they're needed. So we have patients consume uh, marijuana products in a variety of different ways. We commonly think of smoking um, as the most common form, but there are other methods. Um, vaping is uh, the, the act of heating up marijuana to a point where it releases, releases THC, but it doesn't actually burn the product. Um, there are concentrated oils like hashish, um, there are teas, tinctures, there's even creams that you can rub on your skin um, for uh, absorption. Um, another common form that we see here in states that have legalized marijuana are uh, baked goods or edibles. Um, you can find candies, soda, um, cookies, so there's a huge variety of ways to, to take in um, THC. So there is evidence of medicinal or religious um, uses in uh, Central or Southeast Asia um, th that date back thousands of years. And over time, um, its use has spread through Asia, Europe, and eventually into the Americas. Um, here in North America, uh, back in 1619, King George ordered every colonist to um, grow 100 plants for fiber export. And then by the 1850s, uh, medicinal preparations were available in American pharmacies. By the 1880s, um, recreational parlors were prevalent in American cities. However, by the 1930s, states started to outlaw um, marijuana use. And by 1937, the federal government outlawed it altogether. In 1970, it was categorized as a Schedule I drug. Um, however, in the 90s, uh, the tide started to change a little bit. Um, California passed Proposition 215 in 1996, which legalized medical marijuana. This is the current outlook of how states view um, marijuana use and, and sale. Um, there are four states where it's currently legal. Alaska, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, D.C. is also in that uh, group. The lighter blue um, states are states that have decriminalized it and also legalized it for medical use. Um, there are still plenty of states, however, that view it um, as the federal government does as a, an illegal substance. In this upcoming election, there are, there are five states that have legalization initiatives on the ballot, and they're the ones with the yellow highlighted outline. And then there are a few states that have uh, medical initiatives on their ballot as well. So the, it seems that the ten, trend is to continue towards legalization at the state level um, as well as, as medical uh, use on the state level. One of the um, big changes that has occurred since um, marijuana has been legalized for either medical purposes or uh, recreational purposes is that there's been a significant increase in THC levels in, um, in marijuana. So back in the 70s and 80s, the average THC um, amount ranged between 2 to 4%. Um, however, in seized uh, marijuana, um, they have been finding that this can range up to 10% and even higher up to 30% in some um, some cases. So the marijuana that people are consuming now are much higher in the psycho psychoeffective cannabinoids than what was previously consumed. Um, in pregnancy, uh, THC is lipophilic, so it's concentrated in the breast milk and can be passed on to the baby. Um, it also rapidly crosses the placenta, including its metabolites. 
Um, it's been found, it doesn't, it's not concentrated like it is in breast milk in the, in the baby, but it is found in the um, fetal serum and can be detected in uh, meconium. And when smoked, um, marijuana leads to much higher carbon monoxide levels um, in the maternal bloodstream than when compared to tobacco. So um, we could make some assumptions that there's potentially increased risk for fetal growth um, and other, other issues um, for the developing fetus um, due to that. Most studies um, quote 2 to 5 percent of use in pregnancy. Um, however, this tends to be higher in young, urban, socioeconomically disadvantaged women. Um, those who do smoke outside of pregnancy, about 50 to 60 percent will continue to use during pregnancy. Um, and they list a variety of different reasons of why they use in pregnancy. It's common, common listing recreation, depression, anxiety, pain, um, as well as 50% saying they're uh, treating their nausea and vomiting in pregnancy. So how has legalization of marijuana impacted pregnant or use in pregnancy? Um, there isn't a ton of data on this, but there's a preliminary report that came out of the uh, U.S. Drug Testing Lab that looked at meconium samples collected um, from across the uh, United States. Um, they collected in the first nine months of 2012 before marijuana was legalized in Colorado and in the uh, first nine months of 2014 after uh, marijuana was legalized in uh, Colorado. Um, and what they found was that when they looked at the uh, positive uh, rates in Colorado specimens, there was about a 10% increase in THC um, hits uh, between 2012 and 2014. So a slight increase, but not a, a dramatic increase. Um, what's interesting though is that when compared to the THC content or the, the volume of THC in the meconium samples, there wasn't a big difference between the U.S. samples. Um, there was really no change. However, when you look at the Colorado samples, we're seeing a significantly increased um, rate uh, or high, much higher levels of THC in the post-legalization samples than uh, what we were seeing between before uh, 2014. So maybe suggesting that patients are either consuming much more concentrated uh, marijuana, much higher levels of THC, or just consuming more marijuana in general now that um, they have easy access to it through, through um, shops. So what do we know about how it impacts pregnancy? Um, there are lots of studies that have looked at pregnancy outcomes, but um, one thing here is you know, asking about what about its impact of nausea and vomiting? About, as I mentioned uh, just a little bit ago, is that about 50% of women who use marijuana in pregnancy report that they're using it to treat their nausea and vomiting. Um, and what does the data say about how it actually impacts their nausea and vomiting? There are two studies that have addressed this, um, and it's, they're, they're not the greatest studies. So the first one is the one out of Hawaii, and what they reported was that women who used marijuana in pregnancy were more likely to report severe nausea. However, um, the treatment of nausea with uh, marijuana was not specifically addressed in this study. So it's unclear as if the use of marijuana led to more nausea and vomiting, um, like a hyperemesis uh, uh, syndrome that you can see in patients who consume um, high amounts of marijuana, or you know, is the uh, nausea and vomiting the reason why they're consuming the marijuana to help, to help with those symptoms? The second study, um, reported the prevalence of use or the prevalence of nausea among about 80 women who used medical marijuana in pregnancy. 51% um, used it to treat their nausea and vomiting and 92% believed that it was effective. However, the study didn't have a control. There was no documentation of the quantity of marijuana used and no demonstration of the effective symptoms other than subjective report in the postpartum period. So. Essentially, with these two studies, the only thing that we have in the literature about nausea and vomiting and, and marijuana use in pregnancy is that we, we just have no idea of what its impact is. What about um, impact on pregnancy outcomes? Fetal growth, preterm birth, stillbirth, congenital anomalies, neurodevelopmental issues. Um, there are many studies that have looked at its impact on uh, birth weight. And it's you know, biologically possible. We have THC that's crossing the placenta, can be found in the uh, fetal bloodstream and meconium samples. So it would be easy to assume that there's a 
potential that potential risk that um, marijuana use can have an impact on birth weight. These are a list of studies that have looked at this um, issue specifically, and as you can see, the results are mixed. The dark blue studies are ones that indicated no association with uh, low birth weight, and then the lighter blue studies are uh, studies that um, did associate or did find an association with uh, birth weight in prenatal marijuana use. The problem with these studies is that um, the differing methodology of the ascertainment of marijuana exposure. All these studies uh, relied on self-report. Um, some of these self-reports were frequency of, you know, how many times a week, a month, um, a trimester. Other studies looked at just yes or no. Only four studies looked at um, actual THC testing to confirm that uh, marijuana was being used and was detectable in the maternal bloodstream. Um, of these four studies that uh, did actual THC testing, we do see an association with low birth weight in three of the four studies. So um, potentially, if we have better quantification of marijuana, we might be able to, to have a better uh, association with um, low birth weight. The other issue with um, some of these studies, like this Hatch study and the Hickson study from um, the early 80s, was that they did not account for tobacco use. And, um, tobacco use has been very very clearly linked to birth weight outcomes and so um, that's part of the difficulty with a lot of these studies is that marijuana use is very frequently used in conjunction with tobacco so tying the the, the two effects apart is is difficult um, Connor from WashU recently published a meta-analysis in the Green Journal last month that um, looked at this specifically and they had 12 studies that fit their criteria there was about 5,000 patients who used marijuana um, that they pooled uh, compared to about 52,000 patients who did not use marijuana in pregnancy. Um, based on the pooled unadjusted analysis, women using marijuana in pregnancy were at increased risk for low birth weight. However, um, when the studies that adjusted for confounders like tobacco use and other drug use were pooled, um, this uh, the estimates showed that the women who use marijuana in pregnancy were not at an increased risk. There's, um, if you look at the, the odds ratio, there's a slight trend towards um, significance, but it's still not quite there yet. So with um, this study, the Generation R study, they took a slightly different approach. Um, it's a large prospective trial um, in the Netherlands to assess the impact of early environment and genetic determinants of health. Um, what they did was they used serial ultrasounds performed through the uh, prenatal period to assess fetal growth rather than looking at birth weight as the outcome. They did ultrasounds at less than 18 weeks, between 18 and 25 weeks, and 25 weeks or later. Marijuana use was self-reported like what we've seen in the other studies. And um, what they found was that fetuses exposed to marijuana use in early pregnancy grew about 14 and a half grams less a week than the non-users. And the women who used continuously in this lighter um, grade uh, line down here had more significant impact on um, this growth. Ultimately, they found that um, newborn weights um, for continuous users were roughly 300 grams less than non-users. And those who used early in pregnancy were about 150 grams less than the non-users um, newborn weights. So um, a slightly uh, different way to approach it, but um, it suggests potentially there is an association with birth weight. What about preterm birth? So these are some prospective studies that have looked at um, the risks of preterm birth in women who use marijuana use. And again, um, very similar to our low birth weight studies, the data is mixed. Um, the dark blue studies indicate no association with preterm birth and the lighter blue studies report that there is an association. Um, the problem is, again, the methodology of of trying to figure out how people were using uh, marijuana and, and confirming if they were using it. The other issue is that many of these studies um, just use a generic outcome of preterm birth less than 37 weeks. There were two studies, um, Decker and Sarial from 2014, that um, used um, spontaneous preterm birth, and they did find that there was a slight increased risk of uh, preterm birth risk in women who used uh, marijuana. There are a couple of uh, large retrospective studies that have come out of Australia that have um, looked at this question as well. 
Um, this first study from 2011 had, um, uh, had patients who self-reported marijuana use at their intakes for prenatal care. And after adjusting for alcohol, tobacco, and other illicit drugs, marijuana um, use was associated with preterm birth. And then this Burns study from 2006 um, used ICD codes from, um, for substance use and also <coughs> noted an increased incidence of preterm birth. Connor also um, addressed the same question in their recent uh, meta-analysis and very similar to with the low birth weight and the unadjusted data, there does seem to be an association with um, preterm birth. However, when it was pooled and um, using the adjusted estimates for the individual studies adjusting for confounders, they did not see this, um, uh, this increased risk. This study from Shiano kind of highlights part of the difficulties with um, with performing these studies. This was a prospective multi-centered study. And what they found was that 31% of the women who had positive serum screens for THC also reported self-use. Um, self so there were a significant number of women who were reporting self-use but were not testing positive for marijuana. And then 43% who reported um, uh, self-use had positive serum assays. So there were women who were who were reporting that they weren't uh, using, but they were using, and then there were women who were reporting that they were using, but they were either using not enough to come positive on a drug screen or they weren't <clears throat> using at all. When preterm birth association was evaluated in women who reported use and or had a positive drug assay for THC, there was no um, association demonstrated between preterm birth and marijuana use. However, when they only <coughs> used women who had a positive serum assay, um, there was uh, an association with preterm birth, and maybe these are women who are more chronic users or consuming higher amounts, and, and that's where the increased risk comes from. In regards to congenital anomalies, we also see very mixed data. Um, these first, the first two studies at the top um, from the early 80s looked for um, association with any major congenital anomaly, and um, they were not able to find any association. Um, Forrester uh, in 2007 looked specifically at gastroschisis um, and did demonstrate uh, an increased risk. Um, however, the Van Gelder study in 2009 um, did not find that association. We see a similar um, trend with uh, VSDs where there is a, an association in the Williams study, but in the Van Gelder study, no association. Van Gelder did find uh, increased um, association in anencephaly, but this was um, done in a sub-analysis of only women who used in the first four weeks after conception. So it's a little bit hard to, um, to draw conclusions from that, why people who only used in the first four weeks had an increased risk of anencephaly and why those who used throughout the pregnancy would not have that increased risk. Um, Stilbert also has uh, scant data. Part of the problem with this is that many studies that have looked at marijuana use in pregnancy have excluded <coughs> women who've had stillbirth, um, so the data is, is skewed. There's a um, stillbirth collaborative network findings that demonstrated an uh, increased odds of stillbirth by twofold. Um, the study was a population-based study that was racially and ethnically diverse. However, like the other studies that we've um, that I've discussed. There's a lack of quantification and timing of use, um, and we also have the potential confounders with tobacco use. So um, with regards to low birth weight, preterm birth, um, stillbirth, congenital anomalies, there may be a link um, between birth weight and preterm birth. Um, however, it's still unclear um, regarding um, stillbirth, congenital anomalies. Um, there's still very much a need for high quality uh, perspective data to get a better understanding of marijuana use in pregnancy. So in regards to the um, endogenous cannabinoid system's role in fetal development, um, I mentioned earlier that um, the, this system is very tightly regulated. Um, the endogenous cannabinoids are not stored in cells, um, but they are dependent on stimulus um, dependent cleave, cleavage of membrane phospholipid precursors. Um, this allows for rapid induction of the of endocannabinoid synthesis as well as receptor activation and degradation. Um, and how these, uh, these uh, cannabinoids work is 
um, primarily as uh, neuromodulators rather than classical neurotransmitters. Um, because they're able to act on demand in, um, in, in, in ways where they're just produced where and when they're needed, they're able to work in a very, very specific spatial temporal pattern um, to help kind of guide their role in uh, neuromodulation and they've been implicated in short-term and long-term synaptic plasticity. In, um, during development, um, what we see is that the uh, CB1 receptor emerges very early, in very early stages of brain development. Um, it's found within white matter and in cell proliferative regions. And what's interesting is that in both animal studies as well as human studies, we see that the distribution of this receptor is very different um, in developing fetuses when compared to adult brains. Um, and not only are they different when compared to adult brains, they're also different depending on um, the developmental stage of, um, of brain development. And so in early gestation, they're found in developing axonal uh, projections in the cerebral cortex as well as the hippocampus. However, in late gestation, they're found primarily in GABAergic interneurons um, on axons and um, axonal growth cones. So the system um, has been shown to play a role in metabolic support, cell proliferation, um, and migration, uh, as well as axonal uh, elongation, as well as synaptogenesis and myelogenesis. So if we're having patients consume marijuana and expose their fetuses to supraphysiologic levels of cannabinoids, they may be causing a disruption in the temporal precision of endogenous cannabinoid signaling and um, potentially altering synaptogenesis in the development of several neuronal uh, circuitries. So possibly the most frequent manifestation of injury to the developing CNS um, does not result in neuro nervous system malformations, but rather um, functional abnormalities that may not be detectable at birth. So what do animal studies say about this? Um, overall, they support the theory of um, functional abnormalities rather than gross malformations. Um, we've seen um, alterations in neurotransmitter and neuroendocrine systems in the offspring of rodents exposed to cannabinoids. Um, this effect is particularly pronounced in the uh, dopaminergic pathways. And in addition, there have been um, some study, animal studies that have shown a marked increase in hyperactivity and exploratory behaviors. Um, other rat studies have shown uh, persistent deleterious effects of learning and memory functions in exposed offspring. And so the concern with prenatal marijuana exposure is that this, um, that the endogenous or endocannabinoid receptors interact with this exogenous substances such as THC um, and then lead to the um, ultimate uh, disruption of these, um, of target selectivity and uh, differentiation of the developing axons. And so over the long term, these changes result in deficits of in the physical, cognitive, emotional, social, and motor functioning in the offspring that can last into adulthood. Um, this is an interesting study that looked at um, a dopamine receptor expression in human fetuses that were terminated between 17 and 22 weeks in controls and in um, uh, women who consumed uh, marijuana prior to uh, moving forward with termination. Um, what they found was that after adjusting for um, tobacco and alcohol use, um, they found a specific reduction of dopamine mRNA expression levels in the amygdala um, in association with marijuana use, where you can see on that, um, the far picture uh, at the, on the bottom left-hand corner where there's significant uh, uh, decreased expression of, of mRNA of the uh, CB or of the dopamine receptor. Um, this reduction was positively correlated um, with the amount of uh, maternal marijuana intake during the pregnancy. So what about neurodevelopmental outcomes. We see that we can see some disruption in uh, certain neurotransmitter uh, receptor expression. Do we see any long-term effects of prenatal um, marijuana use? There are a couple of studies that have looked at this. There's two large studies um, that have been prospective that have looked at how these kids have done throughout um, school and, and into early adulthood. The first here is the Ottawa prenatal prospective study. Um, it was started in 1978, and the subjects were primarily middle-class, low-risk women who entered the study early in their pregnancy. The researchers took extensive demographic and lifestyle information um, that was gathered several times during the pregnancy, as well as postnatally. The offspring um, have been 
were assessed repeatedly during the neonatal period and then annually up to six years of age, and then uh, less frequently thereafter. Uh, marijuana data was collected categorically as non-users, irregular users, moderate users, and heavy users. And so what we found was that, or what they found, was that at, um, at four, nine, and 30 days, um, they did tests to assess the newborn's capacity to interact with their environment. And what they found was that prenatal um, exposure to marijuana was associated with a decreased rates of visual habitation, um, increased tremors, and a greater frequency of startles, which were both spontaneous in response to minimal, um, spontaneous and in response to minimal ex uh, external stimulation. They found similar observations at nine and 30 days. And then between ages one and three, mental, motor, and behavioral exams um, did not find any adverse effects of prenatal marijuana exposure. However, at age four, children of regular marijuana users were significantly inferior to other children in verbal ability um, and memory. Um, and the, obs um, the observation of a neurobehaviorally significant effect at age four not earlier uh, may indicate that the degree and type of deficits noted um, can be identified only when normal neurologic development um, has proceeded to a certain level of maturity when complex behavior can be examined in a specific rather than a global level. Um, these effects persisted throughout um, uh, school age years. Six to nine years old had decreased visual perception, decreased sustained attention, um, increased impulsivity, decreased um, attention and decreased language comprehension, and similar findings were found in the 14 to 16 year olds. One of the um, interesting things that they've done as time has gone on is that they've followed these individuals into their um, early 20s and they've been forming, uh, performing uh, tests in uh, the setting of functional MRIs and what they have found is that the individuals um, exposed to higher levels or to regular marijuana exposure prenatally um, are able to perform the same tasks as the non-exposed group, but they have to recruit more um, areas of the brain to be able to, um, to perform the same tasks. Second study um, from Pittsburgh is the Maternal Health Practices and Child Development Study that was started in 1992. They focused on a high-risk pregnancy population, so a different population than the Ottawa's trial. And um, they followed a racially diverse, mostly single, low socioeconomic status, high-risk pregnant women who used marijuana during the pregnancy. And they categorized as heavy use, moderate use, and light use. And so what they found was that uh, prenatal marijuana exposure um, affected sleep continuity and organization at birth, as well as at age three. Um, they had similar uh, findings of, of no significant outcomes um, between ages one and two. Um, at age three, the prenatal marijuana exposure impacted short-term memory and verbal reasoning. At age six, um, use of one or more joints of marijuana per day was associated with lower composite and short-term memory, um, quantitative and verbal reasoning scores, as well as lower IQ scores. Um, there was also increased impulsivity, hyperactivity in this age group. At age 10, the exposed offspring were also found to have significant associations with attention deficits, hyperactivity, impulsivity, and memory uh, deficits. And uh, these kids were also um, found to have significantly higher rates of depression and anxiety. These deficits continued to age into ages 14 to 16. Um, also, academic performance in reading and spelling um, and by teacher report was found to be worse in those exposed to at least one joint per day during pregnancy. And at age 14 to 16, maternal use was associated with lower scores in reading, math, and spelling, um, uh, most notably in those exposed um, to heavy use in the first trimester. Um, there was also an earlier age of onset of substance use and a greater duration of use than those than their matched, counter, ma matched counterparts, even after adjusted for home environment and uh, 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 parental substance use. So um, what we're seeing from both the Ottawa study and the Pittsburgh study is that um, the neurobehavioral deficits are not being identified until these kids hit school age. Um, and it may indicate that the deficits may only be identified when um, neurologic development has proceeded to a level of maturity where we can examine it at more specific, with more spe specific exams rather than the global tests. Um, newborn and neonates appear to demonstrate an association between nervous system state regulation 
and uh, prenatal exposure to marijuana. Um, however, between ages two and three, we're not seeing any significant consequences, but um, starting at around school age or right ages three to four, we see um, verbal ability, memory, um, discriminate between offspring of regular users and um, non-users. Um, parents rated children who are exposed to prenatal marijuana exposure to have greater problems with attention and conduct. Um, and so it appears that the, um, the picture that appears to be developing is one um, where kids with prenatal marijuana exposure appear to be more vulnerable in areas of executive functioning. So these are kids who are um, having problems uh, with behavior, reasoning, problem solving, and planning, the, you know, all very critical uh, functions for the ability to attain goals. So. Um, how do our uh, medical societies view marijuana use and what have they uh, published regarding how we should be um, viewing marijuana use in pregnancy? So since legalization, there's been a, a, a pretty sharp increase in publications um, from, from medical groups uh, discussing that we should be addressing this with patients and discouraging its use. ACOG published a committee opinion in uh, 2015 that um, said that we should be raising this issue more, we should be counseling our patients um, regarding the risks and um, trying to find ways that um, we can change their, their habits, seeing if they're using it for any specific uh, pregnancy related symptoms and get them onto something that's more safe and more um, studied in pregnancy. The American Academy of Pediatrics published this um, technical report titled Prenatal Substance Abuse, Short and Long-Term Effects on the Exposed Fetus, and um, had you know, the same recommendations that we should be counseling our patients to avoid marijuana um, in the prenatal period as well as um, after delivery. So how are we doing as providers um, with counseling our patients? This is a study that came out of McGee um, uh, this last year, and they looked at um, uh, providers and how they counsel their patients in regards to prenatal marijuana use. Um, they uh, put together semi-structured interviews um, with OB providers and asked them to describe their thoughts um, and experiences about addressing peri uh, perinatal marijuana use. They had 51 providers who participated and um, providers admitted that they were not familiar um, with the identified risks of marijuana use during pregnancy. Um, they perceived that marijuana was not as dangerous as other illicit drugs. Um, they believed that patients did not view marijuana as a drug. And when it came to counseling patients, um, they focused more on marijuana status as an illegal drug um, and the risk of Child Protective Services being con uh, contacted if uh, parents tested positive at the time of delivery. So um, how, how can we take that information and, and how can we counsel our patients? And these bullet points have come from the state of Colorado and I'll um, show you guys a little bit later. But, you know, it's important to bring this up with patients and bring it up specifically when we talk about, you know, any alcohol, drug, or tobacco use. Um, if patients are not uh, viewing marijuana as a drug, they might not be saying that they use marijuana. So it's important to ask them if they've used marijuana in the last year, you know, when was the last time they used how are they using it? What form of marijuana do they use? We've seen that patients can be taking, uh, uh, consuming marijuana in many other forms other than smoking it. Um, and discussing that the, the concentration of THC is much higher um, in these different forms than what has been classically uh, thought. Um, and then asking how, you know, how has their use of marijuana changed since finding out they were pregnant? It's also important to discuss the myths of use in pregnancy. If you go online, there are many websites um, dedicated to advocating for marijuana use in pregnancy. There are Facebook groups um, of moms who uh, advocate for marijuana use in pregnancy and um, uh, with child rearing. Um, and these are common things that you see. Since it's legal, it must be safe. Um, since marijuana is natural, it must be safe. Since some people use marijuana as a medicine, it must be safe. Marijuana can be good for your baby. Um, Marijuana-like chemicals occur in the body, so it must be safe. And then marijuana is a safe treatment for nausea um, in pregnancy. So, you know, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about its use um, in pregnancy that, that we should be addressing. We should also be um, asking, you know, why are they using it? If they're using it for um, 
symptoms related to their pregnancy. We have many other alternatives that we can offer um, that are safe in pregnancy and see if we can get them to reduce their use or to stop their use. And then also just discuss, you know, the risks that we, that we know that, um, that THC is passed, that is the, is the uh, chemical that makes you feel high. It's passed on to the ba baby when you're pregnant. Um, this chemical can have impact on how the child behaves um, in school, um, and it may make it harder for the child to do well in, in school. So um, it's just, you know, educating the patient is, is what we need to do. However, you know, there's, in addition to, to counseling patients in, uh, in clinic, you know, there's also a need for public health campaigns. And um, this four states that have passed marijuana um, legalization laws um, have addressed this in, in different ways. So in the state of Oregon, they have a website that um, you can find information specifically for pregnant women. There's provider um, related sheets that you can use in clinic. Um, they also have a universal marijuana symbol on all products that are sold um, just to be clear that people are, or this product has THC in it. Um, many of these items that you can buy in the stores, you would have no idea that, um, that they have uh, marijuana in it. So um, just to help kind of reduce accidental, accidental consumption is, and also mainly for trying to um, prevent young children from consuming these products. Um, the other unique thing that Oregon has is that they have a point of sale sign that's required in all shops that sell marijuana products, um, very similar to what we see in bars and restaurants and grocery stores in regards to tobacco use and, um, and alcohol consumption in pregnancy. Um, just warning patients that they should not be passing it on to their baby. Colorado has done a, a fantastic job of putting together a very easy user-friendly website for, um, uh, for individuals as well as providers where they can learn more about its use um, and its impact in pregnancy. They have um, specific bullet points that um, you can discuss with patients. They also have flyers that you can um, pass out in clinic um, to give to patients who use marijuana during their pregnancy. Um, and they also have a, a really helpful handout um, for providers that discusses how to screen for it, um, what issues to bring up, um, how to test for it, um, and other, other um, uh, tips on how to um, get patients to either stop or reducing their use. They also have um, uh, pathways to get patients into uh, treatment if they need it. There are uh, pocket cards for providers to be able to um, quickly assess um, the patient's risk. Um, however, in Washington, we don't have any of these, these um, options. We don't have any point of sale uh, requirements. We don't have the universal uh, uh, THC symbols, and we don't have any handouts that have been published by the um, Department of Health to um, help guide providers on how to address these issues with patients or um, help uh, educate patients. We do have a website, um, Learn About Marijuana, that has um, been put together by the Department of Health. Um, and it does have a page that's dedicated to uh, marijuana use, reproduction, and pregnancy. But again, it's not as, um, it's not as clear as the other uh, uh, handouts and, and websites that have been created by other states. So I think that there's definitely some room for improvement that we could um, that we could have in the state of Washington, including the point of sale signs, um, as well as uh, putting together uh, information packets that are very user friendly for patients. So um, to summarize, um, you know, marijuana is consumed in a variety of ways other than smoking. THC and other cannabinoids cross the placenta. Um, since legalization, the amount of THC that has been found in um, meconium samples um, has tended to become higher. Um, it's difficult to make definitive statements on the impact regarding immediate pregnancy outcomes, but there may be an association with birth weight and increased risk of preterm birth. And um, longitudinal neurodevelopmental studies demonstrate negative uh, behavioral impacts in kids and adolescents exposed to marijuana in utero. Um, so I think you know these are all things that we can discuss with our patients, and these are issues that we can bring up in clinic um, to help try to reduce the exposure to the developing fetus. I also have links that um, I'll send out for all of these handouts um, that are available through um, Colorado's Department of Health as well as um, Oregon's Department of Health.
where my reference is. And I'll take any questions. Yeah, they, there's been a lot of work trying to put together, um, you know, a, a kind of an outline um, like what we see with fetal alcohol syndrome, a, a very specific um, set of behaviors. It's been difficult to, to find enough strong data to, to say this is definitely related to marijuana exposure. As you can tell, there's a lot of confounders, tobacco use, you know, the environment that these children are raised in. I think that um, with the Ottawa and the Pittsburgh trial, you have two very different populations, but you're finding very similar um, impacts. So I do think, you know, that it is cause for concern. Yeah, versus the one, yeah, the ones who used intermittently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I don't know if there's any plans for those studies. I think the fact that that it's now legal in the state of Washington and it's much more readily available, and people seem to be using it for you know longer periods of time rather than just. A brief period during during adolescence or their teen years, um, it would be interesting to look at those two populations of those who use briefly and then those who continue to use. Yeah. Um, in those studies, they looked at. I feel like there are a couple things that were concerning. One was it's, it started in the nineties, and so we know that everything is so much higher in concentration mm -hmm. now that it's going to have a much more bigger effect yeah. if it does indeed have these effects. But did they say anything about breastfeeding? Because we know it's so concentrated in breast milk. Like, was it? It's it's really hard to study the impact on breastfeeding because of the fact that the women who use during pregnancy continue to use with breastfeeding, and so it's hard to kind of separate out those two groups. Yeah. 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 It, so and so it's it's unclear as to how breastfeeding impacts those neurobehavioral. Um, impacts or outcomes. So. But yeah, and, and that's the thing is that in these studies um, that have, you know, in the early 80s there was no ability to actually test for marijuana. And so we now have the ability to quantify how much they are consuming. And it seems that some of these studies that have been doing that have been looking at the actual amount that's being used and confirming it with blood exams shows that there is increased risks or, or worse outcomes in those who are heavy users. Um, and that in conjunction with the fact that we are now dealing with marijuana that has THC content between 10 to 30 percent, um, you know, it's just putting these kids at potentially much more higher risks. So that was a very nice uh, summary of, of what you used to work on today. I guess a couple comments. One is that uh, poorly designed epidemiologic studies that are really not very helpful. You show a full variety of uh, you have to really read right from the get go that you're not going to show it. So, just publishing a study, you have to publish, really doesn't help society. Uh, but it's so poorly designed. And, and, and it's hard to design. Yeah. The 
longitudinal studies, or the, the Dutch study and the, the two longitudinal studies up to age 20 are really pretty impressive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, definitely. I, I think um, you know I would like to try to to meet with either ACOG or get down there for legislation day and kind of raise these issues because these are it's low hanging fruit that we can you know we've shown significant um, you know impact with that type of education in regards of alcohol and tobacco use and we should be approaching it the same way with with marijuana use um, and so yeah it's I think it's definitely something that's would be easily achievable and, and not that hard to implement. So, all right. Thank you very much.